Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SIE Load Research Chapters webinar, where we will be discussing microgrids, social, economic, and technical perspectives. Before we start, a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on their device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. And by default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of this webinar will be made available on the SIE YouTube channel, SIIEE TV, under the Load Research Chapter playlist. This channel is updated regularly, so ensure you check back as often as possible for new uploads. You will see in the chat function is a link to the SIE TV. Please subscribe, it is for free. A, certif a certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar, once we have received the CPD validation from EXA. I'd like to introduce you now to our host for tonight, Mr. Mondi Soni. He is the chairman of the Light Research Chapter. Um, he is also leading few working groups focused on distribution network planning and analysis. Mondi is an elected member of the Council for SAIEE, a voluntary contribution position he has held since 2017. He was awarded the Engineer of the Year in 2019 by the SAIE, the achievement he holds close to his heart. Welcome, Mondi. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Minx, um, for those kind words. Uh, colleagues, good evening. And welcome to our webinar tonight. <clears throat> this webinar, um, we looked at the subject and we saw um, what the requirements or what the need is um, for electrification, not only in South Africa, but also generally in the African continent. We know um, the problem you know, of universal access uh, to electricity that we have, again, not only in the, in the, in the country, but also in the wider continent where we've got what is called far-flung areas. We also have some really complicated African terrains where we cannot or we cannot easily reach using the, the uh, traditional power lines that we are accustomed to. This technology is not necessarily a new technology, but the application at the scale now that um, we find ourselves having to apply it is fairly new to everyone around the table here. So we have selected these two um, experts that will be sharing some of the experiences that they have gathered through their research. So I will um, introduce the first speaker to you. Okay. Now the first speaker is Dr. Mahali Lesala, um, who is a postdoc researcher uh, at the University of Porte, uh, based in Alice. Um, Dr. Lisala is a postdoc researcher. She graduated from Forte University with PhD in Agricultural Economics. She also holds a Master's in Economics, Honours in Economics, in Economics, and a Bachelor of Commerce in Business Management and Industrial Psychology. She specializes in microeconomics and rural development. She is primarily riveted in seeing rural transitions from, sub, from subsistence to a market-oriented economy. She focuses on poverty, livelihoods, and welfare. Over to you, Doc. Thank you so much, Mr. Monde. Um, let me be sharing. Thank you so much for the beautiful introduction. Um, like the title of the presentation says, uh, it, it will show shortly. I'm sure it's coming. There's just a delay from my side, I guess. Mings, are we are we are we okay? Is it coming up? Dr. Lasala, just click on PowerPoint. 
There we go. And put it in presentation mode, please. There we go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, as the title of the presentation says, I hope my camera is or my webcam is off so that there is no disturbance. I'm also trying to check where I'm able to control my slides. Okay. Maybe. All right. So uh, for the sake of time, I'll just go straight into it. So as the presentation is titled, we actually were dealing with the assessment of the social economic aspects of the uh, mini crit project in the upper bin quarter. So the question is why the social impact, the social economic aspect. This is mainly because many projects have failed because of the neglect of this social, the social and economic as, um, factors. Most important, importantly, amongst them, acceptance and approval of the intervention by the community or the beneficiaries is subject to several societal factors, which if they are not well understood, may affect or hinder the implementation or the successful implementation of, of the intervention intended for the community. So this analysis or the social and economic aspect are actually the, the basic consideration for any developmental intervention because they help us understand the needs of the beneficiaries. They help us and uh, identify the challenges before the, 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 even from the planning to, to the completion of the project. They help us also to identify the opportunities that may somehow come in handy in the successful implementation of the intervention. So they, are also, they also enable the community engagement, which ensures that the project is in the best interest of the community. This analysis also helps us to address the social implications to ensure that the project has the long-term positive impacts on the, on the community. So we carried out this study to examine the social economic impacts of the community to demonstrate specifically that the community engagement plays a key role in any community-based project. And according to literature, access to reliable energy also fosters socioeconomic impacts. It also fosters socioeconomic benefits or impacts. So the, the main purpose for this study was therefore to verify whether such impacts have been realized in the community of the upper drink water. So this is important not only for the stakeholders in the project, but for government as well to to have it as a, as, a, as a gauge or a measure for, for all its efforts in basic or delivery of basic services. So two, two surveys were undertaken. The first survey was a baseline survey, which was undertaken, conducted in November 2019. So this was the, 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 the study to document the pre-existing conditions before the, the mini crit was implemented. And 50, 53 households were interviewed. In the second survey, which was a follow-up from which we assessed the changes, it took place in September 2021 and 44 households were, inter, were successfully interviewed. And then data were analyzed. But before we go into the findings, these were the what I'm showing on the screen now is the key indicators that were selected. So since we are social, we are social specialists, we are more concerned about the well-being, uh, living conditions, and so forth. So we adopted the definition of quality of life uh, as defined by the WHO. So among its indicators, it 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 puts to the fore the access to basic services such as housing, cleaning. So our selection or identification of uh, indicators were based on, on the definition according to WHO of quality of life. Now, let us get straight into the findings. Um, 
this table here gives us data from before the mini crit and data from after the implementation of the of the mini crit so first of all we'll start with the population demographics before the mini crit you can see we have 177 this is the total population of the community so we can see that after the mini crit was implemented we have a rise in the population in the population size of the community by at least 17 percent we realize here that we see that the number of households have increased by four households which is uh, as a percentage expressed as a percentage is 80 percent and there is no change in the average size of the household in the community um this table here shows the household demographics so it, it also shows the, the data before the mini crit and the data presented after the mini crit. So when we look at, we distribute our respondents by gender, we realize here that uh, there has been changes in the, or an increase in the female headed households. We see a 68% of female headed households in the, in the community and most of them are between the ages of um 35 and 56 and this rise can be seen mostly on the women who were never when you look at marital status of the respondents we see that the major in, uh, increase in the female headed household was specifically on the women who were never married sorry about that uh, yes, the, the, the percentage of women who were never married has increased. And now getting into, uh, when we are still on this one, I think when we get to the living conditions, when we analyze the type of building, we will get to understand maybe some of the reasons why the numbers of, especially the young people who are never married, is who are getting into early motherhood, we will get to see maybe the reasons. Now, when we look at education level of the respondents in the community, we, we, we can see here that majority of the community members here, you see the total here, most of them only have the basic primary education. Only a few have gone beyond um, secondary school. We have only 5% of female respondents who have at least gone beyond um, metric. And for male respondents, we have only 2%. Then majority, especially on the, the female-headed households, have only primary school education. Uh, looking at employment, we can see that there has been an increase from the baseline of the numbers of the unemployed or percentage of the unemployed in the community so we see here that in the second survey we have 59 percent of the respondents who were not employed compared to 45 percent that is almost 14 percent increase of the numbers of people who who are now not working so when we go straight down to uh we we also examined because in the baseline, we realized that many of them, because of the lack of acti activities in the community, many of them migrate to urban areas, cities in search for, for you know, better living. So we realized here there has been um, a reduction in the number of people who have left the community from 42, 43 percent to 29%. So when you look at this, indicator here and unemployment you can really see you know the, the 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 coordination between the two that many people have returned home then um the number of the unemployed has has risen and majority of them are female respondents we looked into the sources of income in the community and we find that most of the the households in the community about half of the households in the community, they rely on the social grant. 
that is money provided by, by government for child grant and old age grant and disability grant. So compared to before the mini grid was implemented, so we had about 69% of the households depending only on, on grant and only a few were employed. But uh, this time around, when you look into after the mini grid was implemented, you can see that there was a little bit of a rise in the uh, income sourced from salaries among the female respondents. Now, we examined further the income from grant. So we analyzed from what source of grant actually is this money coming from. So sorry about that. I just wanted to show. I'm not sure how to show. There are some figures that are missing down there. I'm just not sure how to show it. So because now it's it's skipping. So what we wanted to show here is most because we said most of these families are relying on the social grant, then the main source of that money is actually the child support grant more and then the old age grant and the disability grant. So what is hiding down there, which I needed to show was that regardless of all the, the increasing number of the unemployed people returning home, which maybe we can also um, uh, attribute it to the pandemic that took place the past two years, but that also maybe deserve further interrogation. But what we need to highlight now is when we look into the average household income, we realize that the average household income for, on, from female headed household has improved from below those of the male counterparts from 1.9 to about 2.7. Unfortunately, I'm not sure whether from your side you're able to see, but from my side, there's a part but at the bottom there that is not showing, which shows the average income. So generally, women, um, women female-headed households, their average income has improved. It has gone above the male, the average household income of male-headed households. We also looked into the type of dwelling in the community. And on the, on the screen here, what we can see is the type of houses that are found in the upper blink water community. This first one here is a single, um, the single room house. It's a multi-purpose actually. So people sleep, it's a kitchen, it's a dining room, it's a bathroom, it's everything all in one. And we found that there are about 70% or 70% of um, respondents who live in a single roomed household. So we have also have a multiple room, um, multiple rooms, which are rooms like not connected to each other in this form. We also have another multiple roomed mud house like this. Then this other one here is a combination of a concrete or cement block and extended with, with mud. So we have also quite a number of these. So the analysis of all those type of dwelling follows. So as we can see here, we have 70% of the respondents living in the mud house. We have 17% who are living in the mixed, the one with the concrete and, and mud. Then we have only 13% living in the the a, a little bit more modern house houses. We also looked into the conditions of the dwelling in this community. So it can be seen in this picture here, the rooftop of the house is the conditions, even the walls, they are almost depleting and which is life threatening to children, young girls and even, even women. So I indicated earlier that we may maybe understand why we have such a, a drastic increase in young women getting into motherhood. So when we, we investigated further, we found out that most of the girls, because they live with their parents, if it's in the home where there is a mother, father, they all live in one house. So the house is congested. So uh, the young girls, they resort to 
getting married or maybe being independent, live on their own than not having privacy in the smaller houses like this one. And at the same time, we'll see later on when we looked into education. So the, the fact that the school is closed in this community has also contributed into uh, young girls getting pregnant, early motherhood and so forth. Now we have um, um, separated the impacts into two as direct impacts from the mini grid and the indirect impacts. So the fact direct impact was access to energy, which is very obvious. So 54 houses, which include the church in the, within the community were connected. Uh, then the electricity is surfaced throughout the day, but the details of when it happens that there is no electricity in the community, we'll see it later in the technical report. So according to the data we got, which will also be uh, elaborated further on the technical report is that compared to ESCOM electricity, so the, the, the community actually pays 54 cents per unit of their electricity, the mini grid electricity. So the second impact, direct impact was that uh, the electricity from the mini grid was affordable was rate, either rated affordable or not affordable, reliable or not reliable. So we asked the respondents if they could rate the electricity. Then 40, from all the 44, this is on the second survey, from all the 44 households, 43 respondents asserted strongly that the mini grid electricity was reliable and affordable compared to the ESCOM electricity. And only one household rated the mini grid electricity as ex expensive but reliable. So the average spending on electric electricity was also calculated, and we found that the community members, on average, they are paying at least 69 rand per month for electricity, which they are using it for lighting, for operating TV, fridges even cooking and boiling the water kettle. So we have here a demonstration of a lady with excitement that she's happy to pay her electricity bills. The next direct impact was through employment during the, during the construction or the implementation of the mini grid. However, because of the lack of skills in the community, so the employment opportunities that were available to the community members were clearing the, vegeta the vegetation, excavation of foundations, mixing of concrete and security, and so on. All those other activities that need unskilled, unskilled or semi-skilled labor. So here I have a table showing or um, showing the distribution of the community members that were employed during the implementation of the mini in, in total, there were 19 community members that were employed. So these are all the young people in the community. So we understand that there was a circulation. So they were taking terms so that at least everyone can have, you know, can participate and benefit in, in that form through employment. So we had the security men, we had store, store men, excavators, casual laborers, we have the community liaison. Although the older people had complained that they somehow felt excluded because there were no activities for, for elderly people. Women also played a role, participated as part of the project through different roles. There were researchers, so there were special, uh, the social specialist, there was a social facilitator, there were, there were community liaison members, and there was also uh, a small business um, entrepreneur. So in total, there were 10 uh, women who were the part of the team of the project. Knowledge was transferred to the postgraduate students from the local institution, which is the University of Forte, through 
research skill, financial support, presentations in seminars, workshops, and publications. And already the two publications are out and there are more that are still under review. Now, still on the direct impact we have at the household level, we realize that modernization is taking place. So we know modernization is now when the community has started using all sorts of appliances. So the details of how many of these uh, of the respondents in the community are used having already the fridges, the television, and so these are uh, the details will be given in the in the technical in the technical report. So there has also been some changes in interaction or building of relationships within the family, especially for females and the young girls, because they bear the responsibility of wood gathering, water fetching and whatsoever. So they spent, they used to spend a little time with their family or if they are to spend any time at all with their family is when they are carrying out their activities. For example, if a mother is to bond with their daughter, it means she has to take her along to gather some wood or to do some laundry by the river stream and so on. But since there is electricity in the community, we can see as demonstrated by these pictures here that they can now spend time, quality time with their family. That has been necessitated by access to the mini grid. And mothers have also indicated that they are able now to assist even their children with their homeworks because they finish, they get to finish their house chores on time and have some time to, to assist with, with the schoolwork. On education, right from the baseline, they, we found that the school in the community has been closed because they could not retain the teachers because there is no teacher that wants to live in the community and even if they are to live in the nearest town to travel between their place of stay and the community is difficult especially in the rainy seasons or for those who do not have their own transport so it was difficult for the community to retain the teachers therefore the school had to close down so however government when we went for the second survey we found that government has made arrangements for scholar transport. They negotiated with one of the local tax, the taxi owner in the community to carry the people to the nearest school, which is about 15 kilometers from the community. However, this end, government pays the, this person, this taxi owner, a, a certain amount agreed upon. However, this agreement is only catered for the primary school people. Those who are in secondary school, the parents still have to provide for their transportation. And when we got to the community during our second survey, we found families with the secondary school uh, people who are not going to school because parents cannot still afford, can still not afford to pay the transportation for their children to the high schools, even for those who are able to pay, there is a kind of monopoly of ownership in transport in the community, which affects most of them negatively because ownership of the public transport is monopolized by one family. So if any member of the community has personal issues with the transport owner, then it, it affects the entire family, even the, the children, they are not able to get in the transport, access the transport to, to get to schools. However, the impacts that were observed since there is um, electricity was that parents indicated that the children are now able to study even late at night without straining their eyes like before when they used to read under the candlelight or paraffin lamps. They indicated that it's also easier for them to prepare for their children in the morning for school. Unlike before when they used to have to wake up early to make to prepare the firewood to boil the water and prepare maybe a breakfast meal. So 
in general, this has also, they indicated this has also led to the neatness of their children because the children can now go to school with their uniforms properly ironed and clean since they have all the time to do all the chores. We looked into our land use. So agricultural production was a, one of those issues of land. Uh, the community is actually suitable. It has a suitable terrain for agricultural operations. However, due to the lack of water in the community, many of them had stopped farming before the mini crit. But since after the mini crit, a, a few households, in a few households, they have already started cultivating the home gardens. So distinctly, there are two individuals who were who were outstanding from our observation. There is, they are doing home gardening, but I could only show just a part of it with this one, the first one with the cabbages. Uh, it's, it's actually a bigger part. So he uses the water pump powered by the mini creek, this guy with this garden. He has also now been commercial, he sells his crops ranging from cabbages to watermelons. So there's just so much, a variety of crops he, 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 he has in his garden. So he sells outside the, the community, within and outside the community. And on average, he said in a good season, he he's able to make at least 12,000 rand a month from the sale of his crops. So there is also another young lady here who also just started, but she's only complaining about um, uh, she needs she 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 complained that she needed assistance with assistance with support for irrigation with irrigation and expansion. So you can see here she was already preparing the land for tilling. On the livelihoods. During the mini the implementation of the mini crit, um, there were some houses in the community that were rented. So that was another form of source of income, although temporal. And there were some businesses that were established since after the implementation of the mini crit. So they used refrigerators and the freeze uh, the deep freezers to sell soft strings and some foodstuffs like meat to, to the community. So before the mini crit, there was just one tech shop in the community, which after the implementation of the, of the mini crit, it has also expanded its operations to wheat workshop. So he produces furniture for the community. He uses the power tools and the welding machines, which are obviously powered by the mini crude electricity. So what we can also see from this um, new establishment is uh, there were more females now who are into small businesses than there were, there were male respondents. Uh, Doc, sorry. We also examined um, so, sorry, Doc. So just to interrupt, I would like you to try and wrap up uh, within the next two minutes. So if All you right. can just try. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. So we also looked into health issues, but then we found that there were minimal health uh, issues when, when they were using their firewood because there's a special type of wood they use, which they will burn completely and they will only take into the house when it's already smokeless. So the other impact of the electricity is that those who are on chronic medication, they can now uh, safely keep their meds in the fridges to keep longer and for it to remain effective. And they no longer miss their medications because they can now prepare the meals on time. There are some land claims, but they never put the project on, on store. So the indirect um, impacts were that there was no access to water at all. The community only used some 
their own mechanism to throw water from the hilltop here. But after the mini crit, although they still use graffiti not powered by the mini crit, the community has now been able to uh, be assisted by the municipality to bring the water tank. And a few of the households, they have already drawn the water into their, into, uh, into their yards and they now have the, the taps. So community engagement, we, we learned that it's, it's its impact has resulted in the buy-in of the community of the intervention, the mini grid itself. So it has re resulted in the project being the community being trusting the project, or usually this kind of project, they'll be vandalized in the community, but because the community was engaged from the beginning, they have that sense of ownership on, of the mini grid. So there has not been reports of vandalism or or maybe a ripping off some parts from the mini crit. So as social socialists, we said we are more concerned about the sustainable use and livelihoods of the community. So we are mostly concerned about um, the economic use of energy, so which will simply entail conservation and efficient use of, of energy. So when we go to the community, however, since the mini crit was um, only designed to not use, it was just for lighting, decide for lighting or light appliances. Cooking stoves were not supposed to be used according to the recommendations from the feasibility study. However, when you got to the community, about 17 households were using stoves and kettles to boil the water and irons, but there has not been any effects to the mini crit. So as um, social specialists, this, as time goes, our fear is as the, commun the community would adopt, everyone else will begin to use the stuff, and this may somehow threaten the sustainability of the mini grid. So what we suggest, although we are saying we are advocating for a complete shift from the traditional use of energy sources to the more modern energy. So we are suggesting that we continue to have uh, awareness campaigns to, to educate the community on when to use their energy, that will be explained further in the technical report and even what type of appliances to use. We also suggest that there should be a different power line for the small businesses since many of them are mushrooming as we speak. Again, the mini grid needs to also reach some profitability. So we are encouraging to increase consumption because with, with its conditions now, the community is not in the state where it can increase consumption unless there is fostering of small businesses. So I have given just quite a number of them, but for the sake of time, we will not go into, into them. So in conclusion, um, we know that electricity is the back, uh, backbone of service delivery in South Africa. So without it, that is why the community of the upper blink water is still deprived of all basic services. And however, with, with electricity alone, the communities, in, uh, the living conditions of the community may not be improved. Hence, we encourage or recommend the productive, uh, the productive use of energy. So through um, improving the consumption while improving the living conditions through establishment of small businesses. So we believe that if consumption, local consumption increases, then this will increase or foster the value chains and even uh, the sustainability of the, of the mini grid. For the sake of time, I will just generalize by saying, so community engagement clearly, um, a, a commu engaging community at every levels of the project is important in, from what we have learned from this community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doc. Um, yeah, colleagues, I, I, I think, you know, we one can really appreciate that there are multiple layers um, in this. Um, so if you cannot take away anything from the presentation, the one thing that you need to remember is that it's not only about the kilowatts and the kilowatt hours, there is also people's livelihood that is also um, involved. And that is what the presentation here 
was um, showcasing. Now, the next presenter, and I've just lost my screen for a second. Yes, so the next presenter is um, Sham Shambira um, Gwamirai. Sorry, Gwarai. Sorry about that, Shambira. So Shambira is, um, he obtained his master's in Earth Systems Physics at ICTP um, Trist in Italy. Um, he also has master's in physics uh, from the University of Zim and a BSc in education um, in mathematics, specializing with maths, uh, as well as physics um, at Bindura University in Zim. Uh, all those were achieved in 2008, 2007, and 2004, um, respectively. He is currently enrolled for PhD in physics at the University of Forte, where his research interest includes renewable energy technologies, which is wind, solar, and he also has biomass. So I would like to hand over to you, uh, Mr. Shambira. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about the energy use surveys and awareness campaign in line with what uh, uh, the first presenter has already uh, alluded to. Uh, as an outline, I would start by an introduction followed by results of the survey and uh, an awareness campaign that was carried out in and then in we conclude and give a recommendation. Uh, the Eastern Cape uh, province, uh, partnering with the uh, Lower Saxon state of Germany, led to this initiative of uh, electrification of uh, Upper Bling Water in Raymond Mashaba uh, local municipality uh, by construction of a standalone PV wind battery mini grid system in two phases. The first phase included solar uh, photovoltaic, a battery bank for storage, a diesel generator as a backup system and uh, it has been in operation now since 2019. The second phase is still outstanding, the integration of the wind coming into the mini grid, but it is expected to be completed by March 2022. And uh, on the map, it shows houses at the upper blink water community that are connected to the grid. And this is where we have our solar panels and the battery. And here we call it the lower uh, the houses at the lower part of the upper blink water. They are also connected to the grid. And uh, when you just enter, um, we have got also houses that are closer to the main entrance. So these are the households that we're being talked about, uh, which approximate to 54. Right. A point of note from literature research. After being commissioned, most of grid solution failed to be operational. Uh, this may have, this may be attributed to lack of monitoring and maintenance, lack of community involvement and sense of ownership, or lack of productive use of the energy generated from the mini grid. In order to address these challenges, we carried out two surveys. Uh, firstly, the baseline survey. In terms of technical, we wanted to establish the existing energy sources utilized before the mini grid. The electrical appliance data, that is the number and the type of electrical appliances in each household. A, a second survey uh, seek to establish if they were still using other sources of energy other than the mini grid electricity, as well as how these sources of energy are used for lightning, cooking, water heating, and space heat heating in every household. How much they were paying for the electricity from the mini grid and other energy sources so that we establish affordability. The reliability of the ele electricity supplied by the mini grid and also the role of gender in energy provision. We also wanted to establish the electrical appliance data that is the number and the type of electrical appliances in each household and their time of usage and appliances they use the most 
you can see that this point is a fall up from our baseline survey. Then we also wanted to determine the average daily consumption per household. And our NS campaign was also carried out to educate the community on power consumption and energy use of home electrical appliances, as well as to address some of the operational challenges noted during the second survey. This graph shown here shows existing energy sources of the upper Blingwater community and the percentage usage. Right, as you can see, all households are still using traditional sources and the electricity from the mini grid, as indicated by here. We have got all in the second survey 100% uh, usage of electricity from the mini grid. And in the baseline, as you know, they were not yet connected to any a or grid system. So it was 0%. So we have got 100%. And then for gas, we've got 85% initially using gas for cooking and eating. But now you can see that in the second survey, a decline to 61%. Then paraffin, we had 92% usage, but it decreased to 45% as a result of introduction of electricity from the mini grid. The wood and coal that they were using for heating and cooking, uh, it was 96% in our baseline survey, but it was re it decreased to 89%. Uh, candles were 94% usage, but in the second survey, it declined to 86%. In general, this shows that uh, they are still using traditional sources, although the usage has declined. Uh, this may be because uh, candles are only used during the period of bad weather when the mini grid is load shedding or has a fault, or uh, because initially, as my colleague has already alluded to, that the mini grid was not meant for health appliances uh, for cooking and heating. So, hence, they make use of wood and gas. Uh, also, from the second survey, a further analysis on how much energy source is being utilized so that electricity from the mini grid and candles was mainly used for lightning as indicated here in the table with the 93 percent uh, for uh, electricity from the mini grid for lightning and uh, candles with 92 percent uh, whilst wood is most utilized in cooking with 92 percent uh, usage and uh, water heating with 67% as well as 87% for space heating. Uh, this is because, the, as I have said before, the mini grid was designed to only use gas for cooking and heating, and the community was being provided with about uh, uh, 9 kg uh, of gas every month, although this uh, did not last long. So hence they had to resort back to the use of wood. So in terms of uh, reliability of electricity, all the households indicated that there are times of the day between 6 p.m. and 10 a.m. when electricity is not available due to bad weather conditions or fault lines and the system's load shedding protocol when its battery state of charge is below 50%. So despite all this, uh, community said electricity from the mini grid was uh, very much reliable. They, they even uh, boasted about them not having a uh, load shedding when they compared to the nearby uh, lower blink water that is connected to, to ESCO. In terms of household expenditure on electricity, 43 households uh, were paying bills in the range of between zero to 200 rand every month. And only one household paid between 200 and to 500 rands uh, due to other economic activities that they were carrying out. But on average, in a month, a household at Upper Bling Water uses 69, 69 rand 52 cents to buy electricity from the mini grid, uh, 175 rands to buy gas, 48 rand to buy paraffin, and 31 rand to buy candles. 
It also costs up about 80 rand per month to travel to Fort Bifort, their nearest town, uh, which is about 40, 40 kilometers from the community to buy gas and paraffin and candles. Therefore, the electricity from the grid was much cheaper than buying other sources of energy, meaning gas, paraffin, and candles, which cost an average of 334 rands for each household per month, compared to 69 rand 52, the cost of electricity from the mini grid. When we looked at the respondents or the person responsible for the provision of energy source, uh, women play a critical role in providing energy for their households. Over 70% or more of households, the female parent is responsible for the provision of energy regardless of the source, as shown by these uh, purple graphs. They show uh, the female parent. Although women are showing greater responsibility, it is important for us to note that in the provision of wood and coal, the mini grid has relieved women on the frequency of looking for wood and coal, hence have time for other activities. The availability of electricity from the mini grid has resulted in upper blink water using electrical appliances. And these are photos taken from their homes showing some of the appliances that they have, deep freezers, electric stoves, microwaves, uh, electric jars, radios, televisions. But of important to notice that 20, 29 households have television sites and 15 households stated that the TV was the most used of all the appliances in the household. So the res respondents of these households watch television for 12 hours or more per day. That's how we measured if it is the most used appliance by number of hours that they, it is used per day. Uh, if we are going to look into detail and compare the total number of appliances that we gathered from the baseline survey and the one that we gathered for our second survey after uh, the mini grid became operational, we can simply see that the total number of appliances recorded in the baseline survey was 104, whilst in the second survey was 275. So this is a total of uh, 171 increase in the appliances after the mini grid. So where are these notable increases? You'll find them in lights, where we initially, we did not have lights, but now we have got 84, which is a total of 84 uh, number of increase. Uh, electric kettle, uh, on the electric kettle, we had four initially, now we have got 27 of them, which gives us 23, an increase of 23. And iron, electric iron, you can see that we had one, and now there are 10 that are in the community, which makes an increase of nine. Then uh, microwaves, if we look at microwaves, there's, there were three, now there are 10, an increase of seven. Refrigerators were also 11, but now they are 19, which is a total increase of eight. And this obviously has brought a positive impact to the community, but also an increase in energy demand. But I also want to stress this point that during the baseline survey, the household appliances shown were not in use because there was no electricity. So although there is a more significant increase in appliance usage, uh, most of these appliances are not suitable for the mini grid. Uh, this is because most of the appliances are not energy efficient or of high wattage because uh, most of these uh, community members, they were given these appliances after telling relatives that we have got uh, now electricity in the community. So they were given appliances, the second hand appliances. And uh, so in, in a nutshell, uh, they are not efficient as well as most of them of high wattage. So uh, the daily energy consumption was calculated using appliances and usage data collected through a questionnaire. 
And uh, the, the power ratings for the appliances in, in the 44 households were checked and recorded during the survey. So if the power rating could not be found on the appliances, uh, the name of the appliance was taken and further checking was done using uh, Google to obtain the power ratings. And most of our appliances at Upper Blink Water were identical, especially electric soaps, electric kettle, microwave. This made it easier to obtain power ratings. But it also indicated that there is an element of if a, com a community member tries this appliance and sees that it works, then it, other members, they will also follow in, in buying uh, the same items. It is good on the other side that if an energy efficient appliance is bought by one member and the others, they will copy the good thing. But if they buy a four plate soap, it means it will bring a, a huge problem because everyone uh, would buy the same product, which we do not recommend for the mini grid. A, a regular time of use was also difficult to obtain because they used appliances at different times, randomly for each day. So the duration of usage was estimated uh, from their responses during the survey. So the, this is a combination of uh, all the appliances. Uh, the previous slide I showed you only for uh, the electric stove. But now, uh, uh, after doing for all, all for the electric stove, we also did for every appliances that we obtained from in the house. So at uh, Upper Bling Water, you'll find that there are TV sets that are 29 in total, refrigerators 19, and these are the units or the kilowatt hour they use per day, the total in terms of all of them. So the daily energy consumption per household was found now by dividing the total daily consumption of all appliances in the 44 household by the number of households. And uh, we obtained the total daily consumption of electricity was at 242.44 kilowatt hour per day for all the households. And an average daily consumption of 5.51 kilowatt hour per day per household was also calculated. Now, these values are in line with the previous feasibility studies that were carried out by Nombakusi in 2019. In his master studies, he gave a baseline estimate of a total daily consumption of 300 kilowatt hour per day for all households in the upper bling water. And the daily average consumption per household was between 4.9 and 6.98 kilowatt hour. Uh, this was modeled using HOMA project, uh, HOMA software. But uh, you will find that this is real-time data where we obtained from every appliance that was uh, in the household that we recorded. So you can easily see that uh, the range of 4.98 kilowatt hour to 6.98 falls our actual, what is happening uh, as we speak, right, at the upper bling water in terms of the average consumption per day. And also Kunel um, from DLR in Germany, they also propose a mean daily consumption of 3.85 kilowatt hour per household in the first year of energy access. And um, of course, this was a little bit uh, an underestimate of what we are getting now, but it was uh, around the ranges. Now, uh, we also studied the battery state of charge for each day based on availability uh, available data of the upper bling water. Uh, this trend is an indicator of electric consumption as it represents percentage of electricity drawn from the battery each day. For example, when the battery state of charge equals 70%, uh, then 30% of the available electricity uh, in the storage is used up. So a significant shift in the minimum state of uh, charge occurred in this red line that is given here. Uh, that was 18 December 2020 for unknown reasons, but perhaps a number of households purchased appliances uh, during this period corresponding to festive season. Uh, since that time, the minimum state of charge continues to decline, leading to a more frequent load shedding events. When we talk about load shedding events, it means that um, if the state of uh, 
uh, of charge of the battery goes be below 50 percent the system automatically shuts down to protect itself uh, uh, to protect the system as well as the, the battery itself so in july and uh, august 2021 there was sort of like 100 percent shedding uh, it became a regular occurrence and also this triggered also our survey to go because we had many reports of uh, some challenges in terms of load shedding. So after our second survey, an awareness campaign was uh, done uh, on the power consumption and energy usage of appliances. So this awareness campaign, we conducted it on 27 October 2021, uh, of course, observing all the uh, COVID-19 protocols during that time, right? A, a poster, we developed a poster for the awareness campaign. A, this poster was developed a, based on our findings. A, from the second survey that we, we did. So the poster included appliances with recommended power ratings available in shops at nearest uh, town Fort B Fort. Then the campaign, uh, this awareness campaign anchored on implementing energy efficient measures, and it was necessary for sustainable operations, and as well as to convince the community not to use inefficient appliances, as well as to shifting certain flexible loads to specific times. Right. If we go to the poster, you will see that on this we had energy saving lights, and uh, the reason why we indicate 15 watt. In our survey, we discovered that in every household, uh, some of the households that are using energy saving lights, they had this 15 watt. So when we went on to check uh, at the market in the shops, we discovered that they can easily get them at Fort B Fort. So we made it a standard, a standardized. Instead of them using the 100 watt, the uh, light bulb and 60 watt, that was a common feature in almost all households. We then prescribed them that why don't you use the 15 watt? But if you can, you can even go to 5 watt or 8,5 watts as uh, uh, from uh, availability uh, from their shops. But we also recommended that uh, instead of them connecting 100 watt in one room, 60 watt in another room, and then 15 watt in another room, we said, why don't you use the same type of energy saver light bulbs so that you just buy, if you've got five rooms, you buy five rooms with the same type of light uh, bulbs, which are energy saving, then you connect. And when you connect, you use an electrical technician who is qualified, because we also discovered that there was uh, some improper connections. So we recommended them that they must actually employ an electrician that is qualified. Uh, in terms of appliances, household appliances, we discovered that they were using the some the, the 4,000 watt a uh, electric stove, 2,600 or even above electric ions, even two plate stoves with ovens, which count makes to about 3,000 watts, electric jugs that were over 2,200 watts, even electric heaters. Then we said. Uh, we recommended now looking at what is available closer to them, two plate stove. We discovered that they are already using some of them. They've got a two plate stove. So we checked the wattage and we discovered that is 1,500 watt. Then we even told them that why don't you, if you switch on one plate, which gives about 750 watt, it can be even uh, more user friendly than even an electric jug, which is. 1,500 watts. So these are some of the appliances. Microwaves, where you look at the wattage, 700 watts. We even uh, uh, told them that whenever you are buying these appliances, you must look at the wattage. Then we also talked about how to save this electricity, where we said you must switch off the lights and electrical devices when you are not using them and don't leave devices on standby because standby mode they are still consuming they will consume electricity and we also 
after observing what was happening, for example, somebody wants to make a cup of co coffee. He fills the, 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 the kettle to the brim and boils, yet he only wants one cup of coffee. So we even recommended that just fill the kettle with, um, with as much uh, water as you need. And then we also taught them uh, about the time of use of our appliances, because we noted that between 10 a.m. and 5.30 p.m., the battery is already full and the power available is coming directly from the solar panels. So they had uh, excess electricity during this time. As, as you can see here from the time of use, uh, the red uh, line indicates uh, the battery state of charge, whilst the blue line indicates the uh, power production by the PV uh, panels. So you can see that uh, between this time of 10 a.m. to half past five, we have got the battery fully charged, and therefore we said have appliances like the electric stove, electric jacks, ironing, they must do during this period. And uh, then uh, during the end of the day, beyond then they can just have lightning and they might also cook earlier than before. Rather than cooking after 8 p.m., they can easily have a timetable where they cook earlier so that they utilize, they don't deplete the battery because a, the system is in such a way that the moment that it is below 75, it switches off automatically the use of air appliances. And uh, when it reaches the state of charge, when it reaches 50%, it switches off everything. They are in load shedding. So it simply means that they no longer have got electricity until the PV production picks up and goes and the state of charge is now above 50%. So we just simply had to educate them so that they utilize the, this period of 10 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. when they've got excess electricity. In conclusion, the awareness campaign brought about insights on which energy efficient appliances to use and the time of usage. It also gave them sense of responsibility and ownership of the mini grid. The community showed a high level of satisfaction and acceptance of elect electricity supplied by the mini grid because in their opinion, it is affordable, reliable, and time saving. Households that utilize heavy machinery for economic activities were advised to shift their productive time between 10 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. The community was educated on how load shedding takes place when the state of charge of the battery has gone below 50%. So it is recommended that surveys are carried out on a regular basis. That is to monitor changes uh, that are taking place because of population growth, uh, improved income, which will likely enable them to buy more appliances and therefore affects the energy demand of the mini grid. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shamira. Um, and thanks, Dr. Lesala. So now I would like to request that um, we go through the answers, the questions and answers session. I will request that our presenters please turn on your, your cameras so we can interact with the, um, the chat box um, in this regard. Dr. Lisela, I can see that it's quite dark where you are. Maybe you need a mini grid there. So, um, right now, colleagues, thank you so much. Um, again, that was very, very informative. And I did get a feeling that, you know, as you are going through the material, uh, knowing how multi-layered it is, um, it looks like the, the, the 30 minutes each um, given does not seem to be, give, to be doing uh, justice. And I can see that Tulisala is like, nah, I wanted to give more. Um, it boils down to um, the fact that, you know, we, we are dealing with the livelihood um, here. And 
once again, it is not only about the kilowatts and, and the kilowatt hours, um, and there is also jobs that get created. There is generally, I think I liked it when I saw the specific indicators that were, fluctuat were fluctuating between one another, one seems to be opposing the other, but then at the end of the day, I think the takeaway that uh, myself personally, that I, I, I could extract from this is the fact that the, the general economy, the general livelihood is um, improved. So there are two questions I think that, that, that I've seen um, coming through. I just want to, uh, to take the first one. So the first one was from, is from Rajin. Um, so Rajan want, wants to know the, the, um, how were the projects financed? Uh, I think that's the first part of the question. And then the second part of the question is the payback period for the two projects. So um, I don't know if anyone wants to take it, but I think I would like to give it to you, Shambira, because you mentioned at the beginning that there was a collaboration. Would you like to just repeat that? in terms of the financing of the projects. You, you mentioned collaboration between governments. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, a, in terms of collaboration, there is a, a Lower Saxon Germany, that is the Department of uh, Mineral uh, Environment and Resources. And we have got our department uh, in South Africa of uh, a Department of Mineral and Resources uh, and uh, with the Eastern Cape government that were in partnership for this uh, to be success. But uh, other stakeholders uh, in terms of uh, implementation, we had the uh, DLR, that is a German, uh, Kanban that uh, also does um, a, in terms of feasibility studies, they're also uh, into solar PV implementation. Then we had uh, CSR on our site that was very uh, pivotal. And even as uh, we were working in collaboration with CSR up to present time, uh, those are the implementers. We had also Nelson Mandela uh, coming in uh, with also uh, solar uh, PV studies that were also part of it. Uh, we had also United Nations. It's also part and parcel of this. So it's a, cons a consortium of uh, many stakeholders that were involved, uh, but being spearheaded here with the, the Department of Mineral Resources and uh, on the other side, Ministry of uh, 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 Mineral Resources uh, or Environmental resources in Germany. Thanks, Shambira. I, I think it, it does demonstrate that, you know, the, 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 the project itself was a collaborative uh, effort from different uh, stakeholders. So that, that, that's great. Now, the second question, um, I think you will need to take it as well, uh, Shambira, or you, you also, Doc, I don't know, it's about the diesel generator from one of the of our executive committee members uh, lloyd is asking how many times was the diesel generator used since the the plan was commissioned unfortunately have, yeah okay let me take it unfortunately uh, the diesel generator has never been has never kicked in because um, according to them they were saying that um, our technicians that came to the to the to the plant when we had problems. They were saying that um, uh, actually the energy that is being generated is underutilized. And uh, it's only uh, the problematic lines on the system itself. It was sort of like they tuned it in such a way that it quickly over uh, when just the button, because they are saying state of uh, charge must be not at 50%. So since they were initially testing it, they were putting it at 50% of which they can lower it a little bit. So they did not want to uh, sort of like kick in the generator, but the generator is, is there. 
Uh, I'm not sure about the kilo uh, the kilovolt amps, but it's a very huge one uh, in terms of uh, 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 capacity. But uh, I'm not in a position to give actual. But as big as it is, but it has never been used. So, um, Dr. Lesela, I, I just have a question for you. I, I realize that we probably have many engineers around the table and the interest is more on the technical side, but um, I am fascinated by the, the, the social side and the economic side, um, the economic aspects of this. So I see the emphasis on, on women, um, and I also saw the analysis at the beginning where you showed um, the, the number of houses or households that are, are, head by, are headed by uh, women. And um, what, what do you think just now in terms of the knowledge, um, you know, the community being knowledgeable, uh, what is the impact of having a television set that you can watch uh, 24 hours. How, how does that um, change anything in, in, in the community's uh, life? Thank you, Mr. Monde. Thank you so much. Okay, my audio is on. Yeah, um, information is key. Information is key. So initially, the community has been deprived from accessing information, news, and everything that's happening around them. So for women specifically, you know, you, you have seen the, 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 the rate at which the young women are getting into early motherhood. So watching television may somehow be educational to them into reducing the rate of, you know, births and so on, interaction with their their families bonding with the, maybe their daughters and so on. So television has actually played a key role because even when we asked, when we asked the respondents, they indicated that they actually love television because they can play it. Electricity allows them to play it like throughout the day. So even when they are doing their chores, they are able like to, to learn what is happening out in the world. So initially before the mini grid, they were not just aware of what is happening in the world. Even if they get to know, they know when already news is old news, but now they are kept in time with, with everyone. So it, it has really played a, a, a basic role. For the children as well, they said it's educational. So they have seen a lot of improvements in their, their ability to, to learn and the eagerness to, to learn as well. Mm. I'm not sure if Thanks, I have thanks. answered so you. It's all about now. No, you have, you have. Thank you, thank you so much, Doc. And, and there is a, Another question here, which is, I think is very important, especially when you have, when you are looking at microgrids as an alternative um, to, to, to the mega grid. Now the question from Tristan who's also uh, a member uh, within the Lord Research, um, he's part of the executive. He's asking whether, were there any oppositions, were there any households or individuals that were opposed to this technology when you were doing what we now call social engineering, because that is what you had to do at the beginning. You had to go to the community, make sure that you manage the expectations, etc. Were there any uh, community members that you found difficulties where initially they said, no, we don't like this thing. Anyone can take that? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, there is actually some, you know, in each and, in each and every society, there is all those prominent people who, who monopolize with maybe or resources and whatsoever. So there is actually some individuals, few individuals in the community who oftentimes blocks some of the development programs when they come into the community unless they benefit them directly before they could benefit everyone else. But we have seen the different we have seen the different response with the electricity. I think it's because it's so basic that every one of the community members was so hungry for it, even those prominent people. So they kind of do not have control over 
the mini crypt because everyone else needed it. Otherwise, if they have blocked, because we understood that there were some uh, small development projects that had come in the community, like cattle rearing and whatsoever, because these people are so rich, they wanted a stake in it. So otherwise, the project doesn't have to, to hold. But then we see a different response entirely with electricity because they really do need electricity because one of them is the shop owner. So he does need energy to facilitate all his, his uh, business activities. So the response, you, you can even see uh, the mini grid has already been uh, in, uh, launched. We haven't had of any like divisions within the community that one wants to utilize it for himself, but where uh, there is this um, business owner, hence we are suggesting that there should be a line just specifically for small businesses because the power tools that he, he uses may somehow, we, we feel they may somehow have a damage or whatsoever, or once everyone else in the community has an appliance to connect throughout the day all the time, so there will be, there will be some negative impact on the mini grid, its sustainability and so. But so far, the community has accepted the mini grid. Everyone in the community doesn't have a problem, although we had challenges with getting information from some of them. When we go on our second survey, uh, there is quite a few of such individuals I'm referring to who refused to give us information. So they felt like now that we have electricity, we don't need to answer your questions anymore. Mm -hmm. No, I think that that, that would be um, expected. Um, now, there is another question here, which I think is also very important, and um, it relates to both the presentations. This, this is from Gail. Uh, maybe before I go to Gail, um, there are some responses from Nomulelo Pahobe as well. She is part of the um, the project team that um, that developed the the upper blink water or the upper blink water uh, microgrid. And I just want to invite attendees to also look out for her comments uh, where she is providing some guidance. Now, in terms of this social engineering, uh, maybe I'd like to give this to you now, um, Shambira. Uh, Gail is asking, um, did you go through some teaching and reteaching and ensuring that this is done in a local language that uh, people can understand um, to make sure that safety is adhered to and the what you call the sustainable energy of use uh, sustainable use of energy is also adhered to. Did you have to go through that? Would you like to share that with us? I saw some nice pictures, okay. by the way, poster. I know that that was one of the methods that you use. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much for that question. <clears throat> yeah, in terms of um, the language, we managed to utilize uh, one of our university uh, members, and as well as uh, Nobule, 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 our social facilitator, the one that you have just talked about, uh, to communicate uh, to the community in vernacular language that is in Kosa. And uh, even our posters, we managed to make sure that the poster has got a very, very minimum in terms of uh, uh, words, but more of pictures, so that they see. So that is uh, how we we tried to reach out to the community. And uh, everything, if you see those photos, the person was addressing was actually talking uh, in, in, in Kosa and uh, interpreting the chat to them. Because we felt that in these posters, Every household, as we speak right now, had got, has got that poster for future use. We did not only do, uh, do it for that particular day, but we actually say to paste it in your home so that when you want to go to the shop, you, you remind yourself by saying, ah, they talked about the what, it, what is it, by the way. Then you go to the shop knowing. So we don't want, and we laminated them so that they don't become paper. 
uh, because paper they just throw it. So we laminated them and uh, they are actually uh, as part of their household as we speak. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, um, Shandera. Now, um, there is one thing that I think is, 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 is also very important. Um, we mentioned the issue about the language um, as, as per Gail's uh, question, and also ensuring that there is a continuous um, engagement with the customers. I think for the engineers around the table and in, in the virtual room here, it is very important that um, when you do the technical design, and this is my take on this, when you do the technical design, you cannot do it alone without having the social impact and without having to have understood what the customer needs. And I think um, the, present, the presenters here also mentioned that there were some case studies, some previous experiences where um, a lot of things were learned from. And, and, and someone, one of the presenters highlighted that, you know, communication was one of the biggest failures of one of the microgrids that were once attempted um, in, in, in the country. So Shambira is a technical, a more um, technical person. Um, how does the information flow? Would you say it flows one way from the social aspects to the technical um, design, or do we have a loop and a number of iterations? How does this work now in practice? <clears throat> okay, thank you for the question. Yeah, <clears throat> it must be a two-way process because uh, during the feasibility study or the pre-installation, the social facilitator must lead in terms of uh, identification of the area, in terms of also trying to also uh, make everyone in the community committed and also to pass the most important information. What is the rationale of uh, having the mini grid? And also to remove the, the, the myth or the, the, the belief that uh, this is different from ESCOM. Because when you say you are now providing off-grid system using solar they they think of that solar way you just buy a panel and put it on top and it only connects to a radio they don't believe that it can be having power lines and everything so you you have to bring them to the idea that uh no this is actually the same as uh, what escom would provide because we have uh, for example in law we have got lower blink water which is electrified by escom 20 kilometers from it, we have got this upper bling water. So as a community, they might feel disadvantaged or secluded. So you need to bring, uh, to engage them on that uh, so that there is a sense of um, uh, ownership. Now, this social facilitator must always be there even, even after installation because we have discovered that through our social facilitator that we have uh, bully, uh, we have discovered that whenever there is a problem of more, uh, malfunctioning, the technicians, technical people has to be informed again that there is this problem that is uh, bothering and also to educate them because once something is not working, there is an element of neg neglecting or, or, or destroying it, uh, trying now to get those um, uh, 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 power lines and sell them. So you need to keep on having somebody on send by a, a facilitator to always say, tell them that no, it's a problem that can be solved and you will keep on having your electricity. You will not have this kind of uh, malfunctioning. Then on the side of yeah. technical, uh, uh, I've also discovered as a technical person, uh, when I when we did the framework about indicators in, 20, in 2019 in Germany about this mini grid. We also discovered that um, the indicators that we are talking about social aspects, they has to inform also on what size the mini grid, on modeling. Like for example, what size do you want energy demand? And because you cannot just, um, I still remember uh, in the first, when we were discussing about uh, 
the design of this mini grid. Uh, we are arguing that uh, this uh, they they used data from a town. You see the one that uh, gave us a 3.85 kilowatt hour. We used data from a nearby, nearby town to model the situation at Upper Bling Water because originally this had nothing like there's no electricity. So the modeling part, you have to estimate it using some other source. So instead of using a, a town, you should have used the lower Bling Water, which is 13 kilometers from the data from there to actually uh, develop load profiles. So these are some of the things. If um, if a technical a technical people knows uh, have been given this information through social facilitators, they are able to implement correctly, and uh, their modeling will be up to scratch. Thanks, Shambera. So, um, colleagues, uh, Dr. Lesala, um, Mr. Shambera, I would like to thank you for your contributions. Uh, to the Mandy, attendees. Can I, sorry, sorry Mali, can uh, I just come in here? There's another question which um, I think is very important, which uh, um, uh, Zanir van Ruyen actually posed, um, which you okay. seem to have missed. Mind um, going back to that question about uh, why was the mount response at smart metering technology not utilized? Thank you. Okay, let's have a look at that. Thanks. Um, that is Karen. Why was there? So, um, sorry, the question is um, why was demand this response and smart metering technology not utilized in the project's load management? Was it a consideration and why was it excluded? Okay, so uh, I think just uh, I, um, we have run out of time. That was actually used. Um, what the colleague is asking was used, and I think Shamira referred to it as a load shedding uh, protocol, where you say when your your storage state of charge is here, then you've got some essential loads that you cut out. That becomes uh, part of managing, you know, load management uh, protocol which is actually utilized on site if you go there you will see um, that in action so the, I, I, I want to say that more questions will be answered and uh, we are going to collect these questions and send them um, to the presenters and um, then we are going to publish them together with the with the presentations themselves so i really request um, the attendees to please Drop your questions and we will package them and direct them to the presenters. But it's a very interesting question and that load management uh, mechanism was implemented at the end, it is in operation. So colleagues, the, now about SAIE load research chapter, uh, sorry, I means just still on that uh, slide then. Um, I would like to request that we join uh, the load research chapter. We can conduct Lloyd as shown on the screen. Um, we have monthly uh, meetings where you know uh, we invite experts to deal with topics like this one, like the two experts that we, we that have blessed us with their presence here tonight. So um, lastly, from my side and from the organizing team, I would like to just thank everyone. Uh, firstly, I'll start again with the presenters. Thanks, Shamira. Thanks, Dr. Listala. And um, also, I'd like to thank the organizing team, the EXCO uh, for the load research, um, which is Tristan. Um, there is also Karen, who was just uh, who had a voice just now. There is Lloyd Sloho, and there is Marcus Dekenham. Also, I would like to thank the rest of the load research chapter members, the general public, you know, within the electrical engineering and social, now social engineering uh, or social sciences um, space. But very importantly, the ghost lady who is behind all of this. So that ghost lady is Minx. Uh, thanks, Minx, for pushing us and ensuring that, you know, we do everything on time etc you know your services are really really appreciated 
um, the attendees. This is impossible without you guys, you know, all from your government departments, from the municipalities, uh, from the private sector, from academia. I saw uh, Mr. Chizonga here from the MUT. Great, um, all welcome. We hope to see you more um, going forward. The presentations, the presentations will be uploaded on YouTube on the SIE um, TV channel for your um, consumption even after this. Colleagues, thank you so much. We are over by five minutes. Enjoy your day. You will hear from us again when we have more uh, exciting material to share with the fraternity. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.